received her degree in women's studies, and she flew in brave flying today to come in from New York, and I'd like to have you all welcome her. But now that I've flown, <coughs> I think speaking may give me a few problems, but um, the title of this talk, Do the White Thing, is actually borrowed from or lifted from an article I did for The Voice that was a rumination on a racially motivated murder that occurred in New York, in a New York City neighborhood called Bensonhurst this past summer. And, uh, <coughs> and that actually happened shortly after the release of the film. And it also happened in the midst of a Democratic primary campaign for mayor between David Dinkins, who's now New York City's um, first black mayor, and incumbent Ed Koch. Um, <coughs> Joe Klein, a columnist for New York Magazine. I'm <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sorry. Joe Klein, a columnist for New York Magazine, had written a piece that was sort of a warning to David Dinkins, um, a kind of strange warning for Dinkins to keep his distance from Spike Lee's movie, um, the reason being, and I'll quote, Lee is cagey and talented, but he's a classic art school dilettante when it comes to politics. His film is more trendoid than tragic, reflecting the latest rifts in hip black separatism, rather than taking an intellectually honest look at the problems he's nibbling around. All these subtleties are likely to leave white, especially white liberal audiences, debating the meaning of Spike Lee's message. Black teenagers won't find it so hard, though. For them, the message is clear. The police are your enemies, whites are your enemies. Um, now, my original purpose in juxtaposing Klein's comments about do the right thing with the murder of Yusef Hawkins, who was the uh, young man who was killed in Vincenthurst, was to show that too often riot and rage come from elsewhere, not from hostile black youths, but from elsewhere, um, white, youth for, white youths, for instance. Um, the other thing implied, I think, in Klein's comments about do the right thing is that black audiences aren't sophisticated enough to go to a movie and experience film as film. Um, and I, rem I was reminded of an interview I did with Bill Nunn, who's Radio Rahim, and uh, do the right thing. I guess I asked him probably something similar, like, well, what's going to happen in New York? It's a very volatile place. And he was like, you know, it's just a movie. And I, so, um, anyway. So I think that instead of looking at um, do the right things, Radio Rahim as a belligerent cipher, um, well, that is actually what he is. He's a, he is a cipher in his film, as far as I'm concerned. Um, but we should look to Sal, Sal's son, Pino, as the potential agent provocator of race, racist violence. Um, although his disgust is conflicted, after all, he likes Prince and Eddie Murphy, it's also vicious. Um, I'm not going to talk very much more. I won't probably have to talk anymore about Do the Right Thing because you're going to see it this afternoon, I hope, if you already haven't seen it. Um, so already there's a little confusion about what doing the right thing could mean. Um, thus far it could mean distancing ourselves, our black selves, from the art house nonsense of Spike Lee's dangerous, irresponsible, riot-provoking filmmaking. Um, <laughs> but in the three films I'm going to discuss, Alan Parker's Mississippi Burning, Costa Gravis' um, Betrayed and John Frankenheimer's Dead Bang, um, doing the white thing could mean becoming a white supremacist. Uh, you know, and of course, none of these films are supposed to endorse that kind of decision, and that's also a decision that, for obvious reasons, not all of us can make. Um, <coughs> you know, these three films I just mentioned, Mississippi Burning, Betrayed, and Dead Bang are by no means identical. Dead Bang was a, a rather minor Don Johnson vehicle, actually. And uh, Mississippi Burning, though acclaimed, was also derided. So I have to say, I think Gene Hackman's performance as an ex-Mississippi sheriff turned G-Man into wonder. And uh, it's, a visually, it's often a visually stunning film. Betrayed is striking most for its ability to sentimentalize, I think, the folks who people hate organizations. And I think that's probably I have to believe that's somewhat of a failure of the film, though it's really successful in doing it. Um, 
one of some of the similarities of these films that I'm going to address a little bit, but probably not as fully as other people could do, is um, one thing is the, the role of the FBI in each of these films. And, uh, and the FBI is often seen as either intrusive, um, bumbling, or cold fish-like. And, uh, or, and I mentioned, actually, the role of the FBI seems important. And I don't think it's a stretch. Uh, because when we look at the civil rights movement in this country, I think the animosity between federal government and states' governments has been a real theme, and it's been documented. And I think, in a way, it also presents itself as a strange kind of repetition of some of the anxieties that were played out in the Civil War, like the conflict between the federal, and, um, federal law and states' rights. And so that's one thing that I've noticed is that the FBI is in all three of these films in a way that is somewhat telling and not completely supportive of the FBI, which is fine by me. Um, the other thing that's interesting is the token use of black law enforcement agents in each of the films. Yes. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, Dead Vein is a, a surprisingly so-so film considering John Frankenheimer also directed The Manchurian Candidate. But it does begin with rather complex series of establishing shots, I think. Um, interspersed with the opening credits are scenes of Don Johnson driving up to a hotel, getting his mail, opening a letter, which turns out to be a restraining order restricting him from seeing his children at their elementary school. Uh, later, we see him in a car parked across from the schoolyard. His son runs to the fence, as does his daughter, and they say, you know, happy, hi, daddy, Merry Christmas. Um, and then there are more credits. And then the next scene, so that's the sort of faux beginning of the film. The real beginning of the film seems to be uh, the next scenes which occur near and in an LA convenience store. Um, the scenes are of a young white male loading a clip into a brownie, strolling across the street and into the store. While we are never given a clear view of his space, we are drawn to an elaborate tattoo on his arm, something like a circle with two lightning bolts shooting through it. A black gentleman in his late 50s is stooping uh, his back to the door, and he says without looking up back, and if you're a fan of 7-Elevens, this is actually amusing for about a second, um, if you want a Slurpee, you're out of luck. And the guy with the gun replies, um, no, you're out of luck, and he puts the barrel of the gun to the back of this man's graying head. Um, <clears throat> throughout their transaction, which is a little bit of a twist, because I think we assume that he's going to blow him away right then, um, they, then, well, throughout their transaction, which includes handing over the cash register money and his wallet, the black man is careful to uh, keep his head bent. And watching this, I think it's fair to ask of this gesture, you know, is it self-preservation or genuflection? Um, and it's also fair to remember that I think there was a time when that wasn't an either or a proposition. Um, money in hand, the customer uh, ask, do you believe in God? And the, the clerk says, yes. Yes, please don't kill me, please. I haven't seen your face. I can't identify you. And the horrific, but I think telegraphed retort, after all, it's not called dead bang for nothing, is no, but I can identify you. You're a dead nigger. And he shoots him point blank at least three times. Um, you know, this is the spur that begins the film, though I have a question as to whether it does, because after the gunman leaves the store, he approach, he's approached by a cop who he also murders. And as soon as this neo Nazi killer becomes a cop killer, that actually, to me, is when the story begins. After all, we do know the cop's name, though we don't know the black man's name. He's, he remains nameless through the whole movie. And I think that he's provisional. I find him sort of, he's a necessary prop for racist violence. And he sort of gives the narrative its initial spin, but that's about it. Um, I also want to digress just for a moment to mention this thing that I haven't figured out what to do with, but I'll call it an, sort of the indirect insult. And it comes in the name of, I think, accuracy and authenticity, especially in the movies that I'm going to be discussing. And it takes the, it takes the form of words like nigger, faggot, Jew, nigger lover, Jew boy, and the combinations of the aforementioned. Um, and in some strange way, I think these epithets sort of split from the film and adhere to those audience members for whom the shoe fits. I mean, at least I find myself remarkably uncomfortable and somewhat assaulted even though in defense of you know, a director's representing racist means getting down and dirty. Um, but the problem for me has been that um, each of these three films is willing to grant a certain degree of subjectivity to its various races, basically by training the camera on them, allowing them speech. And in the case of Betrayed, 
uh, even passion without counter counterbalancing that gesture with black subjects with a certain amount of agency. And that's probably a point you're going to hear again and again from me. Um, you know, these films um, confer and confirm, I think with the exception of the last quarter of Dead Dang, um, the object status of blacks in the film. Um, though perhaps not the intention of the filmmakers, in fact, I think a director might assume that depicting blacks is brutalized would engender outrage and sympathy. Uh, my, my point is simply, without granting black speech, or more importantly, anger, the type of subjectivity that's available to everyone else in the film, including the supremacists, the filmmaker leaves um, the blacks in his films as well as those who view the films in a lurch, I think. Um, Costa Gravis' Betrayed features Tom Berenger as Gary Simmons and Deborah Winger as an FBI operative trying to find out which organization was responsible for a murder of um, prominent and controversial radio show host, a talk radio show host, who happened to be Jewish. Um, this is based, as far as I can tell, on the murder of um, Alan Berg in Denver a few years ago by self-proclaimed white supremacist. Um, the location for Betrayed is in one of the Plains states. Um, a pivotal moment in this film for Kathy, Katie Phillips, who's Winger's, um, that's her alias in the film, comes when Tom Berenger, Tom Berenger's Gary Simmons asks her to go hunting with him. Um, they've recently slept together, and she's al already snuck away to have a meeting with her FBI cohorts, um, which she tries to sort of exonerate uh, Simmons on the basis of his likability. I mean, he, and I think that Tom, Ber to his credit, Tom Berenger, um, really has a performance that makes you like Gary Simmons. I mean, you can probably not like him if you're, I, I'm sort of a sucker for films, so that I do the things that they expect you to do. I sort of like make the ties that are expected of me. So I liked him and was horrified that I liked him. Um, so, and basically this guy is, you know, Gary Simmons is definitely a nice guy, a fine father, a friendly neighbor, at least to the neighbors that are nice to him. And, um, Speaking of neighbors, I just want to mention, because it seems very important to this film and then also to this hunt that I'm going to be talking about, that um, we never see any people of color in bars, in the granary, at the Fourth of July picnic. Nowhere in this community are there any people of color, as far as you can tell. Um, so anyway, after a little horseplay and feigned begging, Gary convinces Katie to go hunting with him. And they four-wheel drive it down a darkened road and into the woods where the others are waiting. And they, um, by now, these hunters are sort of familiar to us because they're friends of Gary's and they're all pretty good old boys. And, I, and once again, I have to say that I mean that because Costa Gravis is so good at um, imbuing these people with a personal life and history that uh, it's very hard to immediately dislike them, even, you know, even though you know what's sort of up. And um, so, but, um, but instead of uh, shotguns and a couple of rifles, these people have semi automatics. and. Um, what they're hunting isn't squirrel or deer. It's a 20-something scared, shitless black man. And his shirt is stripped away. His head's a little bloody. And in order to make things it, even for this hunt, this band of bigots gives him a gun and 10 shots worth of ammo and a minimal head start. Um, th I mean, to me, this is sort of a sick visual pun of a coon hunt. And uh, it comes to an obvious end. They track him down and they kill him. And one thing I'd like to say is, I mean, I was, I was thinking the other night that it's pivotal, pivotal narratively for Deborah Winger because she has to sort of be there and not lose, you know, and expose her co under her cover, blow her cover. But I also think in a way it's vague, vaguely analogous, and this is a much more interesting thing to me, that it's vaguely analogous to, I think, the challenge that basically many whites would face around other whites who assume that either you are racist and they can say whatever they're going to say um, near you and that you won't, you won't blow your cover as also a racist or whatever. Um, so that to me is somewhat interesting. Um, but otherwise, I think this hunt is infuriating not entirely because of what it shows should be infuriating, but because the filmmaker seems to have chosen an easy way to represent um, the grotesqueries of racism. And a question we might want to ask is, in order to understand racism, must we understand the failed logic of racism? I mean, I don't think that, I mean, that logic is rather simple and familiar by now. There's the issues of economics, and then there's the issue of the other, um, and they're not people. And I think within Betrayed, they call Jews and blacks and basically anyone else who isn't Anglo-Saxon, Protestant. Um, 
they call them mud people. So that's not, that seems rather familiar. So I guess my other question, or is w maybe we need to make greater efforts to understand how as a subject, the object of racist violence and hatred experiences that racist violence and ha hatred. Though perhaps this is not an either or proposition either. Um, my problem is with Mississippi Burning and Betrayed that they both seem to have erred on the side of exploring the racist psyche, um, leaving basically uh, the other, the, the other, yes, to fend for you know, ourselves, I guess. And, and this, uh, so with this hunt, I think that the black man becomes really nothing more than a signifier of racism and, and its necessary violated object. And in a strange way, this reductionist representation mirrors the very gesture that is racism. Um, I um, I wanted to do this, but I'm, I have to say that now I know why I went into journalism, so that I can do everything at the last minute. Um, the deadlines are much shorter, and uh, I wanted to go ahead and dub onto one tape all the um, in Mississippi burning all the scenes with black people in it because it's rather shocking what happens and now you just have to sort of rent the film and do the fast forwarding yourself. But uh, the cumulative effect of that gesture, I think, is um, that basically <coughs> while there are actors in this film, black people are the acted upon um, and it's a real problem. And I know that everyone's pretty familiar with the criticisms of Mississippi Burning. I hope that I can add to them in an interesting way. Um, you know, even James Cheney, I think, in the beginning of the movie for that one, that brief moment when the three activists are alive, uh, sits silently, uneasily in the back of a station wagon as if he doesn't have a relationship to the two uh, white men in the front, Mickey Schwerner and Andrew Goodman. Um, and his once, and I think that's very funny because his one spoken line, and I think it sort of alludes to this idea that's sort of carried through in Mississippi Burning that, that you know, the black folks have a secret knowledge, kind of an instinctual knowledge about things. And it's, he really sort of says something very prophetic, but what a surprise. Um, Schwerner says, as the Klansmen are ramming their car for the first time, you know, what are these jokers playing at? And James Cheney replies, and this is really the only speech, the only speaking he does. He replies solemnly, oh, they ain't playing. You better believe it. Um, but as we all know, Mississippi Burning is not about activism or about organizing or about the struggle for civil rights. In a sense, you know, that murder on a dark country road in the early moments of the film is a statement, um, a disclaimer even. One has only to read recent histories of civil rights years, like Taylor Branch's Party in the Waters, or to see, I think, Howard Hampton's documentary, Eyes on the Prize, to know that organizing efforts in the South occurred with and without the assistance of nor Northern civil rights workers. Um, I think that the real, I think Alan Parker's real failure is to think that uh, the civil rights, the grassroots issues and organizations of the civil rights movement um, were not narratively compelling enough for a Hollywood film, I think that's, I think that's a mistake, and I think that he's said that and he's accountable for that. Um, by beginning this film with the murder, I think that Alan Parker gives, you know, he gives his detective story slash buddy flick its not so obscure object of desire, which are the murderers, um, something to chase after. However, the placement of the murder also signals the, for, the foreclosure of activism as a subject in this film. All the activists are dead, it suggests which brings me back to the idea that in this movie, black people are almost exclusively acted upon. Um, though there's one striking exception, and I'll talk about that shortly. Um, you know, in the opening shot of Mississippi Burning, black, black people are cast immediately as vulnerable, as far as I can tell, and the soundtrack swells. It's a spiritual, of course. And um, we see two water fountains, one marked white, the other colored. First, a white man enters from the left side of the screen, stoops to take some water, and leaves the frame. Next, a, next, a small black boy uh, enters, drinks from the colored fountain, and leaves. And uh, to me, that suggests from the start that black people are going to be cast both as vulnerable but as innocent as well, because just the juxtaposition of like a white man and this little child is, um, I think, you know, I think Parker is pretty consistent throughout Mississippi Burning. Um, and how 
black, I mean, how blacks figure in this movie. Because I think that blacks are shown as, you know, as beaten, harassed, wounded, or they're shown as grieving or mourning, or they're in church. And that's like almost the only activity they're allowed. It's like church is sort of an activity. But the sentimentalizing of um, the spiritual in Mississippi Burning says that the souls of black folks are particularly forgiving and particularly suited to suffering and loss. Um, once, you know, once again, that one of the only black characters to have any depth is a child preacher positions, to, I mean, to me, it's a position to the black community as a strange sort of spiritual entity. Um, spiritual, but not political. And I think that's a false dichotomy, first of all, for anyone who's familiar with the black church and the history of the black church. Um, but I think also, more to the point, we are reminded that where there's religion, there's supposedly no anger, and this like sort of lack of anger is really my little pet peeve, I guess. Or at least, you know, that the anger is tempered by resignation and forgiveness. Uh, when the little reverend's house is attacked and is, and is set aflame, his father runs out of the house, a shotgun in hand, and says, I ain't taking this shit anymore. And there is, um, you know, there it is. I think that's the one spontaneous, furious moment of rage in the whole film. And unfortunately, uh, he's knocked down, beaten, and strung up. And it's a little unclear. I, I mean, I've watched it a number of times, whether this man is dead or not. I think that he isn't, but it's really hard to tell. Um, I mentioned earlier, that there, you know, the strange role of enforcement agents in Dead Bang and Betrayed and Mississippi Burning, um, and in these movies more so than others, I think, especially if the agency is the FBI, um, the agency becomes sort of the family, the officer's community, and I think that basically um, means that I think the black, black men become sort of a little less black. So, um, what I, you know, and I have, I, so, I have some qualms about suggesting that there is something that is like authentically black. But for the moment, I wanted to say that I think that they become a little less black and that they become a little less threatening um, because now they have a new family, which is the Bureau. Um, and any aggressivity that takes place uh, is now in the name of like the law in a very different way. So in Betrayed, you have a guy in a suit whose passion for the bust of these white supremacist or this white supremacist organization it would probably be equal to any other bust. And, and you know, and that makes him a consummate professional. Uh, and also is born in this flat as his white colleague, and also not a very sympathetic character for the most part. Um, I think the atmosphere in Mississippi Burning is a little bit more charged, however. When Agent Ward, the Kennedy-like Fed, decides that um, Gene Hackman's Agent Ward, who's played by Willem Dafoe, decides that Gene Hackman's Anderson um, that his by any means necessary tactics should be tried, things, things do get interesting, I think. Um, there's a midnight abduction of the mayor, of the mayor who, though not really part of conspiracy, seems to know about all the cover-up, of course. And he's, um, he's blinded, gagged, taken to a shack, where he's confronted by um, a rather impressive black man who tells him slowly and methodically the story of a young, a young black man who'd been castrated for no other reason than his color. Um, he takes his time describing the mechanics of this assault, um, and as he's describing the mechanics of this assault, he pulls out a razor, and of course the mayor's eyes fill with terror. Anyone who watches Alan Parker knows that for some bizarre reason, that is probably about Alan Parker to some degree, castration figures in to many more films than just this one about um, the civil rights movement. The <clears throat> well, so the mayor's eyes fill, you know, fill with terror, and he's still gagged at that time, and the black man comes over and sits near him, uh, razor in hand and ask what's happened, you know, what happened that warm July night the, that the three workers were killed. <clears throat> I mean, we don't hear him spill his guts, but, it, but we know that he does. And then the next scene is of the same black man in an airplane waving goodbye um, in a rainy evening. And Anderson informs Agent Ward and us that, well, you know, this guy's sort of a specialist. And if you hadn't already gathered that he was, um, um, FBI agent, you will now know that he is. I, I sort of knew, so different people are, have different levels of surprise about that scene. But what seems important to me and what's really rich about this whole scenario is that he's the only black man who gets to actively express any kind of anger, and he's actually doing it in the name, I mean, and he's doing it as an actor so that it's sort of mediated, and I just keep thinking that it's very interesting that there isn't sort of an unmediated anger 
and one would expect there to be. Um, so, you know, historically speaking, I also think it's a little complicated because I think that, you know, if this guy is a specialist and he's in the FBI, it's, it's just as likely he uses the same skills to sort of keep tabs on, the, you know, the SNCC and the SCLC and any other civil rights organization that Hoover was gunning for. Um, <clears throat> you know, I know that I'm sort of, you know, racing through this, so to speak, but um, I worked on that joke just before I got up here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and I think that I'm probably going to end with some rather naive questions, actually, but hopefully ones that will be helpful to viewers. Because um, I don't really, I mean, these movies are made, it's not really about thinking that the movie should have been something then that it wasn't, so much as like learning how to read them differently. At least that's how I, I have, I don't really mind that they're made as, in such complicated ways. I sort of enjoy that as long as the next ones aren't made in the same ways. Um, <clears throat> I guess my, what strikes me, and it, it, and it really is probably my one major point, is that the inability or unwillingness on the part of these films to depict any real agency for blacks and I know that I keep saying that it's anger that sort of suggests agency, but I think when we're talking about white bigotry, then perhaps anger is what would express that kind of agency. Um, that it suggests that you know white filmmakers have a problem with black anger and that they aren't able to express it, and they're not able to depict it, or, they're un or that they're unwilling to depict it. And I'm not really clear. That's more of a question. It's like, why is it so much easier to represent what we already know as opposed to what we don't know? Um, and the reason I began with Joe, Joe Klein's comments on Do the Right Thing was to suggest that this anxiety about black anger and violence, and I think particularly directed at whites, because we have lots of films where black anger is di directed at blacks, and I think that we're also accustomed to black anger being sort of presumably directed at blacks. Um, that's, you know, I think this anxiety is rather pervasive and, and shocking in the light of sort of the statistics on biased crimes, which make it that anxiety also sort of ill-founded and probably defensive in a way. Um, I guess that the, with the fascinations, I guess a fascination with the motivations, I'm sorry, uh, you know, I think that this fascination with the motivations of racists is sort of old territory and is unlikely to bring about that much change in the way people look at race because it is familiar. I mean, there's a scene in Mississippi Burning that's basically right out of to kill a mockingbird, and those are many, many years apart. And I don't know how much longer that's that kind of romanticization is acceptable. Um, so anyway, I guess that all I would want to end with is that when you see Do the Right Thing this afternoon, I think you'll notice that both white racism and black anger are, you know, are tackled, and probably not in ways that people are going to be particularly comfortable with. I think that it's been a rather controversial film, and it is a film that has some problems. But um, you know what? What would be the fun if, if it didn't? So this is my last point. I guess that I'm supposed to uh, field questions if there are any. Yeah. More of an entire film industry, mm -hmm. it seems like very few films are told from the point of view of those who struggle, more, more often it's from the point of view of, 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 of someone else, right? Those who are struggled upon. But, um, is, is do you think there's any other good examples of films? Do you see something emerging? Because it seems like there's a million good films out there, you know, whether it be like the Jewish garment workers on the east side or whether it be the civil rights movement of people who struggle to, to make right. it a better country. And there's Gloria and Nate one that I'm familiar with, but I don't know if there seems to be a growing trend in that or not. Switching the point of view. Well, one is, I mean, I would say that probably it'll, the point of view would switch somewhat more naturally as the people who are struggling get to make the films. And that's not to say, I just saw Gloria recently and I thought that it was really pretty interesting. And that was, so some, I mean, that's a weird switch though because it, it goes back and forth. But um, I, I can only say that, yeah, if we pretend and it's possible that Spike Lee is sort of like, you know, the end to making different kinds of films for black people and that he's not gonna be the only representative of that, then yeah, it seems like people will be 
able to make more films where the, the struggler gets to ha articulate their point of view. So, and also, it's not just the TV or, or things like you know, murder in Mississippi, which at least attempts to do what to be you know where it ends is where Mississippi burning begins, and that's sort of interesting. So we had some time. Yes. I remember when some of the first all black oriented television series came out, there was some concern that they were basically being turned into white families, and the objection <laughs> by the white producers, Norm Blair among others, was that if you tried to show the ethnic side of black culture, you were accused of stereotyping. Is there a way to reach a balance? Well, that's. Those two <laughs> I think that's so funny because someone last week we were just talking about differences between not the Jeffersons per se, but from like Good Times, Bad Family, to the Cosby Show, where, and I was speaking with an, another African American, and I think we were talking about how they, those, that in Good Times, they actually did just take a chance and show a kind of like idiomatic blackness or whatever. I don't really know how to explain it, because every time you try to pretend that it's one thing, it gets kind of slippery, which is the nice thing about it. But um, I don't, Stereotyping, I mean, I think that, you know, and do the right thing, there's this, there's a weird sort of cartoonish quality to it that makes all of those characters not particularly full as, I mean, or fully developed. I mean, all, all of the black characters, basically, which is kind of shocking. Um, but is that stereotyping? I don't know. I mean, that kind of thing seems, it just seems so weird because what is familiarity? And, and you do play that on. And um, so I'm a little, I'm not sure what could happen, because I think Cosby would be one of those families where some people, depending on class, I mean, this starts to be a class issue, actually, of what is, um, a, what is stereotypical black behavior, or what is a stereotypical black family, because is Cosby not, because one's a doctor, one's a lawyer, and then isn't Cosby because, my God, the guy just like throws in more stuff about black history than any other, sh I mean, almost like, it's almost too much. It's a little unbelievable sometimes, but it's very interesting. So I think it's very hard to tell what, I mean, I think that because, well, I don't think it's so emergent as everyone says, but if there's like this black middle class, um, then presumably it's going to even be harder to know what's stare, you know, what is an authentic black family. I mean, I almost have trouble to figure out what would be, you know, how would we stereotype people because who knows, it seems like different families. So anyway, I don't know if that answered. It doesn't even know. <laughs> yeah. I was just one, one problem we have is that we, we see so few African Americans in movies. Movies are based on stereotypes almost all the time. Television, totally. You did hear everything made. When uh, Asner on Sunday was saying that he was talking about the uh, <coughs> part of the FBI agent, the other FBI agent, who was sitting there. Right, Gene Hackman. Anderson. I think it was the same outfit you wore in the French Connection. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, but they use a character to establish the guy who walks on right, screen, right. you know who they are. And you get so few African American characters that you don't get a chance to get nuances out of the stereotype. Each one has to stand for everything all by itself. So it becomes a stereotype whether it is or not. Uh -huh. But yeah, I would buy that. I think that. Um, well, there's also this desire that if, if you, never, you don't have any black characters, that then when they come on, aren't they the real black characters? I mean, isn't that like representation? of our lives in a particular way. So we're like, yes, there we are. And then it's like, well, the next step is really like, oh, we're not there, that's film, it's great. We have, we have stories. But there's sort of this weird tension because of the fact that there's like not a lot out there, I think. Hi. I just have a question. When, are, um, when, when is the film going to be Right, so you have to look at you know at black publications for the most part, or or an S, you know that sort of thing. Yeah, um, I don't know because that's a real problem. That way, I think that that's a little. Hard. I'm sorry, I don't actually know because the media is a really weird thing to me. I work at a paper where that's the, where you would expect that more often that there would be sort of critics of color, so to speak. And uh, and there aren't all. I mean, there's like a real tension not to let people, and that's you know to let people write because 
they don't know enough about film. But so I don't know. Probably as, as more people go to school and decide that they want to be critics of like you know different cultural forms, then hopefully. I don't know. Well, right. <laughs> well, you would think. Well, no, that is sort of astounding, and I imagine you're sort of talking about Woody Allen. But um, I don't know. I mean, you would think that if, if and when artists listen to critics and it changes the way they do things, then yeah, it'll make a difference to have critics who are actually looking films and seeing that there's an absence in a way that other people don't. I mean, probably white critics at times don't. I mean, we're just more conscious of like a lack that seems rather striking. So presumably, if there are more people writing that there seems to be a problem, there are these absences, then maybe things would change. Is that, I think I'm disagreeing with you probably. <coughs> Hi. I'm sorry, I mean, I, I agree with you that you need to wait for more people to write um, I'm involved with ISU theater. We just started doing minority theater the past two years. But the minority theater that we do, uh, they just do a mocking room. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you got some, bl some blacks in there, but what, they're up on the top in the jury right. scene, and you've got one black man, and that was it. We have black actors in ISU theater, but they don't get any parts. Because, I mean, like, you're doing as you like it. Yeah, you can throw them in depending on how you're going to interpret it as you like it. If you want to do a straight Shakespeare show, they don't really usually show up. The Lion and Winner. Right. You're not going to find a black person in the Lion and Winner. Well, non traditional casting is a real challenge, um, but really necessary. And so, not just so that, not just that you have plays by black writers where there are lots of roles for, um, or plays by any minority writers where there are lots of roles for um, other minorities, you know, for minorities. I think that non-traditional casting is sort of what you have to do. And yeah, it'll sort of, you know, it actually forces people, if you have Shakespeare and you have act, and it's not a fellow, and you have um, black actors, then people are gonna go, what are they trying to do? And it'll be, but at some point, maybe, it'll be like opera, and you'll go, God, isn't that just regular? <laughs> so. Shakespeare did development. Right. I mean, what's the, I mean, why can't we have race drag? So, I mean, people are actually rather flexible once you force it on them. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make a good task, this, I'm sure. It might be possible in theater, but isn't film a little too literal for us? I believe that James Earl Jones would be just as good doing Patton as George C. Scott, right. but is the public uh, going to support something like that? As an actor, we should be able to say he's an actor who's doing an excellent job. But there's something about the tyranny of the scene. Well, there's something about the tyranny of scene, which is like really why race is probably such a mess as it is, and to some degree. So, yeah, I don't think we're particularly. I don't think this is. I mean, we're talking about sort of an activist kind of filmmaking, I think, because you really, if you like sort of set up Patton as black when you have like this historic. First of all, you're suggesting that history can be switched around in different ways. And I think that that's a real challenge and there are gonna be viewers who will follow you and there are gonna be, and, it, and there are viewers that won't for a while. So yeah, if we're talking about major motion pictures, it's gonna take a while because we think that that represents reality, you know? <laughs> so if we have a little bit problem there, I think. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I think uh, that's really interesting, James Earl Jones' path and whether or not that would work. And yet, you know, I felt, extremely dumb because I was 24 years old until I realized that Cleopatra looked nothing like this table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, also, also, I'd like to um, you know, interject the possibility that I think a lot of reasons that characters, especially people of color, are depicted in a certain way in films is to keep a certain status quo of image and perception. Mm -hmm. you know, because film has such a great ability to create, distort, and change people's attitudes, you know, that if certain characters or certain peoples are portrayed in certain ways, they mm -hmm. may overall have a much greater effect on society. Uh, and I like to use the example of, um, like, E.T., 
Mm -hmm. Now, up until E.T. came out, any type of a space movie that had anything from outer space, if you saw it, what would you do? You know, you want to kill it, you run from it, you think it's going to eat you up. Now, I don't know if anyone in here has ever run into a space creature before. Not have you? <laughs> yeah. If one walked through the door, what would we all do? All right, so that, because we never seen one in real life, but all we had was films to go on. And yes, Spielberg comes out with E.T., this little ugly creature from outer space. <laughs> and I also like to say, almost the darkest thing in the entire film. The only dark right. thing in the film. You know, and yet, all of a sudden, with this one film, space creatures can be loved and can play with your kids and live in your closet. You know? <laughs> and, so, and so I think it's the thing that, you know, if Hollywood was to open up the doors and, and, and uh, you know, show a lot of other minorities, people of color, in more positive lights, you know, then I think it's that people will start to accept, will not be afraid. You know, I've been, I've walked up and down the streets many a time, you know, and like a couple of white women be walking towards me, you know, and like they start to, you know, do their handbags and stuff. You know, whereas two or three white guys in front of me, and they just walk straight. But as soon as they get up to me, you know, why well, they don't know me. But when they see TV, when they watch films, mm -hmm. somebody black is snatching a purse, raping them, robbing them, or doing something like that. I believe that that is what Hollywood is about as far as keeping a certain level of fear and tension going on. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Great. I'm curious about what you think about Eddie Murphy's Friday Remarkably bad movie, that, and I like that movie, <laughs> but it was so bad. I, mean, um, I didn't, you know, I mean, as for the depiction of blacks, though, actually, that's not something I have like a huge problem with in a way. I mean, I don't have like a lot of, I don't put a lot of store in his. I guess I'm not one of those people, I think that positive images are important, but I'm also like, no, I just think proliferation of images is important. I think that's even more important than whether they're positive, whether they're just solely positive. And, that's another. I mean, to me, that movie is such a star vehicle that I and so unreal and on the sound, you know, on this like staged lot and stuff. But I just really didn't lose my mind about what he was doing so much as as have a little problem with how he does with women. So that was much more my problem with that film. I think how how he deals with women or kills women. Uh, oh my goodness! I'm sorry. Someone else? <laughs> Someone else. Oh, okay. I, I just wondering, I think a lot of your analysis is based on a more objective standard, which it obviously should be. But how would you rate Hollywood films in the light that it's almost completely and totally white controlled and profit controlled? And so how is it doing in, in, the, in, in, in that frame? Well, in that frame, I mean, it's sort of funny because I think I would know what percentage of the population we were, but I don't. I think that profit-wise, you would think that we actually had, we would have like a, a greater proliferation of images because we, you know, we spend money at the movie just like you folks do, and I just think that that's so that suggests that they're not doing very well at all, and that it is a little bit more tightly controlled because if it was just about making loads of money, then you think they would start. I always think. I mean, I say this as a voice too. It's like you want more readers, you want more viewers. Why don't we start covering more issues with people of color in them? Because we purchase too. We have purchasing power too. Get it? TV is actually much more representative of like this new trying to get that market. Pretty soon, TV's going to be you know there'll be cable and there won't be like you know, it'll be you know black television network, but there won't be a lot of other stuff for people of color. But the networks, the four networks, will be completely. It seems to me for people of color, which is kind of strange since what they do is basically sell us things we don't need. <laughs> um, did, did you want to ask a question? Yes, um, I hear some, from, from some of the people in the audience are very concerned about the type of stereotypes that blacks do portray when they're on television. Mm -hmm. How would you go about addressing how we as black actors and actors cannot take upon a role? I know sometimes we are in the bad field of not getting a role when right. black people come out. But even just watching a movie in Harlem, I was thinking about um, I heard a lot of nigger that was used a lot in that movie. Right. And what really bothered me was that I know that if another black walk up to me and we just casually joking, that is a part of our way of communicating that we use the word 
are that I can understand and accept it from that individual. Mm -hmm. But yet it's still from the white American youth that it puts me into another stage. It puts me very, makes me feel very uncomfortable now. But yet it's still we as black Americans, we so we so caught up about how we or uh, how the white man depict us in movies and things. Mm -hmm. But yet still I think that we should have some control over things that we don't want them to say or things that we don't want them to use against us. Why do we as as, as actors and actors go about taking on roles like in the movie the Hall they use the word nigger a lot. Right. Although I didn't get offended, but I, I looked beyond it and said, well, what kind of message that white American is taking from this, you know, mm -hmm. it is used? Do they really understand the concept that black Americans can use this against one another in such a way that it won't be so vain with that we will get mad with one another, but yet still when they use it, it's something else that we use. So how would you? Well, I think that, you know, part of the problem is, well, when, when the relationship of using words that sort of, that are derogatory, I mean, there are all kinds of communities that like take words that are, have been derogatory and sort of turn them on their head. I'm not always comfortable with it, but I think that that's what happens a lot. So that, you know, yeah, you see two homeboys on the subway and they say, yo, nigger, blah, blah, blah. And it's just like, doesn't make me lose my head at all. It's not like this thing where I'm gonna like get in a fight. And, um, <coughs> but, uh, but I think it's funny because here's Eddie Murphy sort of know, knowledgeable about this. We're all knowledgeable about the fact of the currency of that term, turn of phrase, but he's decided to invite a lot more people to the, you know, to the party than just you know, all of us, people of color, who understand how that's used. And I think that may be complicated, and I think that, um, uh, but I, yeah, actually I do think it's sort of complicated, and, and I don't really know where, where to go with that, whether it's, Unacceptable. Well, I'm pretty sure that he as an actor knew that that movie was just not going to succeed in that life. Of course he did, because he wants to make money. He didn't only know it, he wanted it to be seen by lots of people. Of, I'm hard on actors and actresses who take on roles like that. I, I, I applaud I'm harder on directors and writers because actors and actors need to take on roles. I mean, I, I, mean, I think that it's. For a director like Murphy to sort of say, I mean, maybe you don't always have to take on a role, but I do think that some people have gotten to where they are and are actually able to do some things now because they, oh, they can't, I can't believe I'm saying this. I don't know. <laughs> I think I'll leave it at, I don't know. I just think that maybe people who are trying to make a living doing something that, um, like actors and actresses, I think that maybe writers and directors should be accountable before the actors and actresses are, because writers put the material in there, first of all. So and sort of force people to make like these weird decisions, you know, do I want to act or do I want to waitress for the rest of my life? I mean, that's where you decide, you know, you decide to be hard on the actor and that's the decision they're making when the writer's like, well, why does he have to write it that way? So I guess I would sort of make accountability a little further up the ladder. Well, where does the consumer, consumer come in on this? Because mm -hmm. here in England, they show the homeowners. <coughs> Well, right, that's even more I just, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry. I was just going to tell you the right thing. They didn't show any uh, black people. 